Hello there, my fellow Chevaliers of Bretonia, and welcome back to some Warhammer Fantasy lore. Today we shall continue our miniseries on the Twelve Dukedoms of Bretonia. I think I might have said this last time as well, but while this series was initially supposed to be just about the capitals and big cities of this land, now I know for certain that it's gonna be about the duchies themselves. Hopefully one video for each. I'm also approaching these in a random fashion, so if you guys would like to learn about a particular duchy, or dukedom if you will, do let me know and I may appease you. For today though, these are the lands of Artois. I am your host, the Grail Knight GDN for today, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Artois, like pretty much the other twelve, is a founding dukedom of Bretonia, which lies at the heart of the northern lands of this kingdom. The land of Artois is dominated by the dense and mysterious forest of Ardennes. Apart from a small strip of land in the western reaches, the entirety of the dukedom lies in that dark woodland. The land outside the forest is predominantly arable, and is home to most of the dukedom's population. The forest, however, is not entirely devoid of human life. Outside of woodsmen and charcoal burners, the forest is also home to a number of villages. Each of the settlements is surrounded by a ditch, bank and wooden stockade. The stone keep of the noble lord to whom the land was granted also typically serves as the gate to the village. The villagers raise animals because, unlike crops, animals can be brought inside the stockade when they are attacked. And attacks, unfortunately, are quite common. Wolves and bears are the least of their problems, as groups of beastmen are far from uncommon. Indeed, a village in the forest can expect to be attacked by beastmen at least once a year. The Dukes of Artois have long made grants of land in the forest to brave young sons of Bretonian nobility, because they are the only ones who actually try to establish vital outposts against the dark forces in the woods. Unfortunately, many of these fail, and destroyed villages dot the dukedom's eastern region. Beastmen are the most common monsters in the forest. For some reason, Artois sees particularly great numbers of brays, which are usually used as cannon fodder by their gore superiors. Of course, that is not to say that there's very few gores, there are just incredibly many brays. Other creatures touched by chaos are also common in Artois, and some lost villages appear to have been torn apart not from the outside by beastmen, but from the inside by mutants. Indeed, the level of mutation leads many to suspect there is a potent source of chaos somewhere within Artois and anyone who could find it and destroy it would be a great hero. The peasants and the nobility of the western reaches of Artois are much like their neighbors in Lyonnais or Languille. They like to emphasize just how much they are a part of the wider culture of Bretonia and the old world, and younger people are encouraged to travel. The residents of the forest also barely think of themselves as Artois. Indeed, many of them are barely aware that the dukedom itself exists, the villages sighted on a major road might see a traveler once every week, but those further in the depths of the forest will not see an outsider in a lifetime. Leaving the village is regarded as suicidal folly. In many places, people hold funerals for those who leave, and assume that those who return are undead. The nobility travel to the ducal court at least once a year, and so generally avoid extreme isolation. The residents of the villages on the whole know almost nothing about the outside world. Adventurers from the west of Artois usually leave home because it is expected and encouraged. Indeed, western Artois produces more adventurers per head of population than anywhere else in Bretonia. Adventurers from eastern Artois usually leave because they can no longer stand living in the same place, hemmed in by the perpetually threatening woods. The western part of the duchy is ruled by the Earl Laret, a cultured scion of a cultured dynasty. He is rumored to have spent much of his time of errantry disguised as a minstrel, rather than fighting like a proper knight. He has never dignified this rumor with a response, and when he has taken the field he has acquitted himself honorably. Whatever his background, he is a masterful politician, and he has made western Artois loyal and peaceful but to him rather than the duke. He is thought to be planning to petition the king for baronial status. 
The eastern part of the dukedom is made up of independent thieves, too concerned with surviving in a hostile forest to ever get involved with politics. The duke is most active here, hunting down beastmen and sometimes riding to the rescue of a besieged settlement. Even more occasionally, and unfortunately, he arrives in time to actually save someone. Slanderous rumors suggest that there are chaos cultists among the eastern nobility, and even that there are villages where the inhabitants willingly consort with beastmen. The knowledgeable dismiss the latter rumors, but worry about the former. One of the most known nobles in the forest is Baron Clodagar, a Grail Knight. He actually requested lands in the forest of Arden, and he personally leads a group of his peasants on a trip to the city of Languil every year. He is active in expanding the fiefdom, which now consists of three settlements, and the visits to Languil mean that the peasants know far more about the world around them than many other peasants in Bretonia. Clodegar also oversees the construction of a grail chapel in each village, fortified and designed to provide a place to fall back to. Each of the chapels also has a bell tower, but a bell is only supposed to be rung to summon help in case of attack. Well, Duke Schilfra basically ignores his neighbors and rarely attends even the royal court unless specifically summoned, Duke Adelhard of Lyonnais is trying to win the Earl Larette over to his fealty, thus expanding his own dukedom and confining Artois entirely to the woods. The Earl, fortunately, is loyal to Artois and resists these attempts. The heraldry of the House of Artois shows the head of a boar, symbol of the dangerous beast Morfanok, which Folgar slew long ago at the first meeting of the Grail Companions. The seat of the Dukes of Artois, Castle Artois, is located in the forest as well. As a result, it is the only ducal seat in the kingdom with no town outside the walls. The castle itself, however, has a substantial keep and a very large courtyard, surrounded by a stone curtain wall. There is also a ditch beyond the wall, but it is fitted with sharpened stakes rather than water. Duke Schilfra is always based here, but he spends half his time riding out and killing beastmen. The courtyard contains accommodation for many warriors. The Duke found the ability to retreat quickly after a successful battle is vital in the woods, accounting for the high number of mounted yeomen here. The large number of horses means that the castle needs many more supplies than normal. The stream of wagons is almost constant here. The Duke disdains using mercenaries in combat, but he does hire expendable outsiders as scouts. For the second part of the video, I thought it would be cool to tell you the tales of several unique associated with Artois. And to begin with, we have Folgar of Artois. Folgar was the lord of these lands by 977 IC, when Gilles Le Breton began his own campaign to free the lands of Bretonia. Folgar joined the Grail Companions of Gilles right before the ninth of the Twelve Great Battles. On the morning after saving Paravon from the Greenskins, the Companions made haste into the west. They entered the lands of Musilon, pride of the realm of Landuin. Alas, hope was false for poor Landuin, for in his absence the land had been turned to smoldering ruin. Cattle lay slaughtered in blackened wasteland, and the once pure river was dark with foulness. A bilious stench carried up from the swampland where in times past the virgin glade stood proud. The companions rode in grim silence through the gates of Musilon to join the remnants of Landowin's family and Folgar, the neighboring lord of Artois. Together they defended Castle Musilon against a great undead army marching under the full moon. Beset by beasts and the living dead, the companions fought as madmen, one to each wall, there to hold out alone against the enemy. They did find triumph when Landowin struck down the foul vampire that had called forth the dead of their place, and the beast fled howling into the darkness of the woods. After the securing of all the lands of the Bretoni tribes, a great meeting took place in the home of Folgar. Skilled as none other with the lands, be it at war or hunting, it was he that would host all the gatherings of the companions, and for the first one he slew the dangerous boar Morfanok and from then on his heraldry was a white boar's head. Here the former dukedoms were created, and the Bretonian calendar was introduced, as year 979 of the imperial calendar is considered year 1 of the Bretonian calendar. 
Each of the great lords of the Bretoni, the fourteen Grail Companions, including Gilles Le Breton, were named dukes. The dukes would swear oaths of allegiance, and Bretonia proper was formed. Reynard the Hunter, or Reynard le Chasseur, is another knight known far and wide throughout Bretonia for his passion for hunting. He has become such an expert with his great boar spear that he prefers to use that in battle rather than the traditional knightly lance. He rides with a hawk perched on his wrist, and he is always accompanied by the faithful wolfhound Groff and Griff, whose savagery and loyalty is unmatched by any hunting hound in Bretonia. Reynard likes nothing more than to track down a warband of orc raiders and set the dogs on them. He often chooses to lead the retinue of squires into battle rather than join with other knights. He is indeed infamously known for regarding any battle as just another hunting expedition. On the edge of the dark forest of Ardennes rises a proud fortress of stone and alabaster, the ancestral home of Brandywine. Lush vineyards stretch from beneath the shadows of the spires, and many hunting bands ride through the woodlands seeking game. Jean-Luc Brandywine, heir to the Lord of Brandywine, was one such hunter, reveling in the sport of the hunt. One misty morning found a young heir astride his warhorse called Sauvignon, and accompanied by his faithful warhound Merlot. A terrible cry came out of deep in the forest, and at the scene of the commotion he found his father, Lord Brandywine, sprawled across the ground clutching a grievous wound in the side. Lord Brandywine had been ambushed while out on his morning hunt by a treacherous and craven knight, wearing only black and striking without warning. There had been many in the land of Artois who envied the Brandywine's rolling fields of fruitful vineyards, for he produced the best wines for the Duke of Artois' table, and it won many prizes for his labors. In a hundred and fifty years of the ruling Duke's ancestry, the Brandywines had always been favored above all others. Jealous vintners of the region would certainly have motive to usurp the Brandywine dynasty, though which one for certain, young Jean-Luc couldn't guess. The only way to find the culprit behind that travesty would be to seek out the Lady of the Lake and sip from the Grail. The mystical powers of the Grail would clear the mists of intrigue and reveal the identity of the assailant's master, and the new young Lord of Brandywine could exact justice for the death of his father. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Dukedom of Artois, its lands and some of its characters, for today. As you've noticed, GW clearly didn't bother inventing some new names for a lot of Bretonian stuff, and simply used the existing French names. Not that I'm entirely against that, mind you. Sometimes using the original name can convey meaning faster than a name which is clearly derived from something else. Island of Sartosa, I'm looking at you. You're also gonna hear this from me repeatedly in these dutchy videos, but I do apologize if I butcher any French words every now and then. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts on this Dukedom of Artois in the comments below. Thanks a lot for watching to the end, and I wish you an awesome and healthy day. The blessings of the lady be upon you.